Well, good afternoon. Here we are in the middle of the week, and we're getting ready for another week. Uh, today's June the 10th, and uh, we're looking forward to worship together on Sunday. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, Brother, Brother Dwayne is having youth services outside tonight. He's the only one that's attempting to bring people together here at the church campus, and they're going to do it outside, weather permitting and social distance, and we're still as a staff uh, trying to flesh out how we're going to regather together and when. We're kind of waiting on what other churches are doing and what our local government's doing, what the schools are doing. So just be prayerful of us. Be patient. Uh, someone is uh, to meet all together back on Sunday school, Wednesday night, Sunday nights, right now. And others say that they're not willing to come back until there's a vaccine. So we have, uh, we just got to get a lot of things organized and a lot of consensus but we want you to know that we're here for you. We're doing ministry in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're depending upon our Sunday school leaders and teachers to maintain uh, the love and the care and the concern for each other. And I just want you to know I'm so grateful to hear the stories of how Sunday school classes are continuing to minister to one another and check on one another and uh, most of all uh, proclaim the word of God uh, through their classes. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, as we started this new sermon series um, in the month of June, we have started a new series that we're looking forward to all summer on the life of Joseph. And I've entitled this uh, series, Joseph, A Hero Forged of God. This past Sunday, I wanted to bring home the premise, the idea that God's people needed a hero. And God chose Joseph and forged within him, God forged through fire of adversity and through dramatic dysfunction in his family and through false accusations, even imprisonment, God forged within him a life and a heart of a hero. And Joseph would uh, later become uh, the viceroy, the, the second most powerful, uh, the main regent in all of Egypt. But before that happened, uh, there were lots of things that happened in Joseph's life that, to be honest, many of us as American Christians would say, well, that just simply wasn't fair. One of the things that really struck me in studying uh, for Joseph was how God used Joseph and created within seemingly a spoiled young man as the, as the one who was the recipient of his father's love, the recipient of the uh, flashy, many-colored coat that he got from his father, which should have been reserved uh, for his firstborn, Reuben, but because of Reuben's misconduct, he didn't get it. And so he transferred and bypassed uh, all the other sons, and lavished his love upon Joseph. The coat of many colors. Um, according to the Jewish rabbis, it was the wedding garments of both Leah and Rachel combined to make one beautiful tunic. And so it's a symbol of prestige, power, of an inheritance, and of royalty. And so no wonder his brothers uh, didn't care for him. And then when he dreamed, he, God gave him dreams of what was going to take place decades in the future. He shared that with his brothers and with his father. And of course, they hated him all the more. We noticed in Genesis chapter 37 that four different times it says that his brothers hated him. And they hated him all the more. And their anger and resentment grew and grew and grew towards him. And I just shared Sunday. It was kind of like the pressure mounting up in Mount St. Helens Volcano. Uh, that exploded so many years ago. It just kept building. And so we understand that there was a dysfunctional family that Joseph was a part of. And I always run out of time on Sunday morning. And it's just the obvious application is God can create a man of integrity and a man of forgiveness out of chaotic circumstances, out of a cesspool of envy, out of hatred and violence, even with his own siblings, God fashioned within this young man a model for all Christians for all time. And to be honest, uh, in so many different ways, a type of Christ. So I just want you to think about it. Jesus was sent to his brothers. He was sent from heaven uh, to earth, born into a Jewish family, sent to the Jewish people, and they resented him. They rejected his words and ultimately they threw him into a pit and the sister blew Potiphar's house, or not Potiphar, but, uh, but uh, Caiaphas' house, and then they uh, executed him uh, through crucifixion. 
Uh, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. He was sold into slavery. He felt abandoned and cut off from his brothers, from his fathers, and uh, he found himself in unwelcome circumstances. Later in life, he became uh, a husband to a Gentile bride. And just like the most of us who worship the Lord here in America, we're Gentiles, we're non-Jews, and yet we've been accepted as the bride of Christ. So many parallels uh, to the life of Joseph. If you want to hear more of that, come and hear the first part of the sermon this next Sunday. But what I want to just drive home, the idea is this. Our country is in chaos. A lot of people are in, I mean, they have experienced uh, spiritual and emotional uh, whiplash going from being uh, shut down with COVID-19 and now fear and not knowing what's going on in our country. Is our country spiraling out of control with the media just showing all this unrest and all this anger? And it just reminded me of what I learned from uh, Joseph, that he was in uh, a family that was eat up with the sin of envy. And we see that a lot today. There's just envy from uh, one class, from one group. There's envy, and that leads to violence. And this this always been this way. It's been this way since the Garden of Eden, since Cain uh, struck down Abel. Uh, envy and anger uh, has always been a part of the broken, rebellious human condition that has cast off uh, God's rule and God's ways and wanted autonomy from God and wanted personal rights and wanted uh, it, it just never ends because we're never satisfied a depraved heart is never satisfied so there's envy there's violence and then there's indifference you know that was a big sin I can't believe and I read here in the scriptures that uh, after they uh, saw Joseph coming that they conspired to kill him Reuben said let's not kill him let's throw him into a pit and they, threw, they stripped him of his robe. They beat him, threw him into this pit, this empty cistern, naked. And they indifferently sat down to eat while he's screaming and he's begging and he's asking for help. And they're just totally indifferent. Well, there's a lot of that uh, that goes on in our world. And we see this. So we see um, that there is envy, violence, indifference, and then there's deceit. Uh, they just flat out lie. And we got to, why we have to be so careful about what we hear politically, socially, from the news networks. The Word of God is our source of truth. It's the fountain of truth. You want to know where you can plant your feet? Don't plant them firmly, firmly in midair. Plant your feet on the solid ground of Scripture. And so I just want to encourage you to understand that in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of all this turmoil, and in the midst of what seems to be unfairness, uh, God is very much in control and He's very much orchestrating that His plans and His will would come to pass. I want to read to you just something uh, that I, I'm, I got several different books that I'm working through and I'm using my resources for the, the series of messages on Joseph. And one of the things that really spoke to me, Steve Farrar's book uh, that's called God Build. This is what he said. He said, here's the deal. When we look into the life of Joseph, you may wonder... What in the world is going on? How can God allow such cruelty, such chaos, such violence? Why didn't he step in and save Joseph? Why didn't he step in and prevent his brothers from hating him, from conspiring against him, from committing violence and violently attacking him and then throwing him in that pit? Why didn't God stop it? But what we have to see is that God works his mysterious providence in ways that seem strange to us, in ways that seem slow to us. Be honest, Deuteronomy 29.29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord. There are some things that we don't have the capability of understanding because we're just like a, a, a two or three year old that wants to demand our will and our way right now, not knowing that if we got our way, that what we might receive or that which we might want would be harmful to us. Our Father knows what's best. We have to trust Him, even during the dark days. We have to know that He's in control over devastating loss. We have to know that He's in control of all events. We have to know that He's in control of all the different assignments that He gives us. We have to know that He's in control over all heart-wrenching setbacks. We have to know that He's in control when we have broken hopes and broken dreams. We have to know that He's in control when we find ourselves 
waiting and begging and pleading and wondering where he is. We have to know that he's in control when powerful people seem to dictate when we meet, where we meet, if we can meet. We have to know that he's in control over famine, over weather, over disasters. That he's in control over whether or not we get promoted at work, or we get demoted at work, or we lose our work. We have to know that he's in control uh, whether we advance in life or have setbacks in life. We have to know that God is in control over every event in our life and that he is working it all out to conform us to the image of Christ for our good and for his glory. As Christians, we have to have a biblical understanding that we can trust God and that he's in control and that he has all wisdom, infinite knowledge, and that he is doing his plan for his will and his kingdom to come forth. Christian, I just want to remind you what Philippians says, Philippians 1.6. He who starts a good work in you will work to complete it in your life. So we just need to be obedient. We have to trust God. We have to pray, trusting him, learn from scripture, learn how to stand upon his word. Remember what uh, the Apostle Paul said to the Christians at Ephesus. He talks to them in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 1. I mean, it's amazing. You need to sit down and read the entire book of Ephesians from uh, chapter 1 to 6 in one setting. Read it as it was written, as a letter to two church leaders. This is how you're to live your life. First, he starts off with who he is as one called of God. How uh, God sent his son Jesus and predestined and foreknew and that he established uh, his plan and that he's executing that plan. And our identity is in Christ. Our identity is in who Christ purchased us to be. We, we have to keep our uh, reflections upon who God sees us, what God says about us, and what God is causing to happen in and through us and for us. I just want to remind you, when you were purchased by the blood of Jesus, if you have repented of your sins, trusted Christ, God sent His Spirit to regenerate you and make you a new believer. He gave you a new position. He gave you a new title. He gave you a new destiny. Now you belong to Him. You've been adopted into the family of God. And it's all by grace through faith. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 is about. And that God has a great plan in the mystery of the Gospel to flesh it out. And that the world and the demons of the universe, they can't understand the masterpiece that God is making through you and through your work part of God's church. We're, we're a phenomenon. It's part of the mystery of godliness. In Ephesians chapter 3 and 4, how do we practically work that out? In Ephesians chapter 5, how we're to conduct ourselves in a family unit, how we're to respect one another, submit to one another, trust God's leadership, our roles that we play. Then Ephesians chapter 6, after we've done all this, we understand who we are, who God is, we take our stand, we have the revelation of faith and grace, our new identity, our new position, uh, our new destiny, our new inheritance. Then in Ephesians chapter 6, he tells us, once you understand all that, stand. Take a firm stand against the things of this world, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in high places, and put on the armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Take up uh, the sword of the Spirit. Put on the belt of truth. Gird your loins uh, for action. By what? By truth. Put on the gospel sandals of peace. Make the thinking, your thoughts have to be scripture focused. The helmet of salvation, your salvation in Christ ought to affect everything you think, the way you think, the way you perceive, uh, the way you interpret what's going on in this world. We have to be a scripture saturated people. And our only offensive weapon is the Word of God. That's why I keep telling you, we have to be master students of the Word of God. You have to know the complete dramatic picture of redemption. From Genesis to Revelation, know it. And then you won't be shook up by all the things that happen. Now, you say, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. No, really, it's not. Because let's just be honest. When I watch the news or I get, um, I get tempted and I uh, actually click on that thing that the, is asking me to click, and all you hear is bad. All you hear is negative. All you hear, and it's like chaos. You just see envy and strife and violence and hatred, even amongst Christians. And you're like, Lord, is there any hope? Yes, there's hope. But our f hope is found in Christ, in His Scripture, 
And guess what? It's the cross of Christ that unifies us. And I just want to appeal to you. You know, think deeply about what the cross means. We had the privilege of baptizing uh, a fellow this past Sunday. And as uh, Tyler was baptized, I just went, he gets it. It's the cross of Jesus is where our hope. It's the cross of Jesus that provides forgiveness. It's the cross of Jesus that reconciles sinful man to a holy God. It's the cross of Jesus that makes us all equal, no matter our nationality, no matter uh, our prosperity, no matter our situation. It's the cross of Jesus is the great equalizer. So I just want to remind you, in these chaotic times, place your faith in Christ, know His Word, Learn from the example. That's why I'm preaching uh, an expository series of messages on Joseph. What does God want to teach us through the life of Joseph this summer? So come this Sunday. And we're going to look at Joseph. How he, um, how he was uh, uh, trusted uh, and how he was tempted. And we have, to, we have to work through in our own lives. Can we be trusted as God's stewards? And how will we handle temptation when it comes. Not if, but when. Well, listen, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to come Sunday, and I want you to be blessed by the Word of God, and I want you to be encouraged as God's people, and I want you to understand that our God is in control, and that as long as there's sin in this world, there's going to be rebellion, there's going to be chaos, there's going to be inequality, there's going to be uh, bitterness, anger, strife, all these things, the Bible tells us, all these things are going to even be ramped up before Christ comes. So I'm going to tell you the same thing I told my teenage son. We're closer now than ever to the coming of Christ. And we ought not be, uh, we ought not be upset and we ought not be too startled. We just need to read our Bible and understand. The, the temperature is being turned up. The furnace uh, is being turned up. And we need to keep cool heads and we need to have confidence in who God is, that His plans will succeed, and that we are in His will. Mm-hmm.